Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the two hour chart of silver provided by netdania.com. And we're approaching a very key point here. First of all, we're approaching this downtrend line that goes back to July. And you can see we just ticked up above it. Now, this is a very valid line. You can see it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven touch points before it breaks out there. The other one that's absolutely critical is this resistance line right here. And you can see we're approaching both, we're actually just a little bit through the trend line and we're approaching that resistance line. That's very, very key as I said, because this is, this is the peak of the volume barring some type of absolutely phenomenal volume that comes in in the future, which I'm starting to think the chances are less and less now as the volume is starting to go down. But we have the potential, in my opinion, of a short squeeze here of epic proportions to where um, there are a lot of people who probably got in long thinking that 15 was as low as they could push it. If that's the case, we don't even know how fast the price could rise. In fact, the price could rise so fast that Harvey Organ could turn out to be right. Now we're seeing the same thing lining up in gold, not nearly as dramatic as silver, but uh, I'm starting to think that we may be getting that short squeeze. I wanted to continue that sort of theme when we look at some of these stories here. I'm going to start out with a story that broke today, and this was a big stunner. This is Gold Repatriation Stunner. Dutch Central Bank secretly withdrew 122 tons of gold from the New York Fed. Now, this is very important because if this trust um, and the two main parties that are being trusted would be the Bank of England and the US Federal Reserve. If the trust is broken down, and I'm going to show you there's two ways that the trust is broken down. If you remember the way the thing started was with the end of World War II and Bretton Woods. Clearly the United States and England were the victors uh, most of the gold and silver flowed into the United States. They were able to uh, back the dollar with gold, essentially, at least for foreigners. And that lasted until Nixon closed the gold window in 1971. Now, we've been on a free-floating petrodollar system that is starting to break down as well. So now we're starting to see the movement in gold. And this is, this is big. We, we saw Venezuela want their gold, and then we saw Germany ask for their gold, and now we're seeing the Dutch Central Bank, and this could become a flood as people start to ask for their gold. Now, why does that happen? We're going to get to that in a second, but I wanted to show you where I think the gold is going to go and why this is so important. So, before we get to that, I want you to look at this news story. Occupy founders advise Hong Kong protesters to retreat as support dips. Hong Kong CNN, the originators of the Occupy Central movement, suggest protesters should retreat as new polls show support for the movement is flagging. In a random survey of 513 people conducted by the University of Hong Kong, 83% said pro-democracy protesters should cease their eight-week occupation of major roads in Hong Kong. Uh, given the backlash from the community, we've advised students to think of other forms of protest. So this is very important. Now, I think this was probably a U.S.-inspired attempt at a color revolution. You have to remember that even though... Uh, we're told that people revolt because of freedom. Really, that tends not to be the case. People revolt because of economics. They revolt because of their standard of living. And the standard of living in Hong Kong is very high. The standard of living in China is, is growing. I'm going to show you that. The numbers are absolutely startling. 
but we're going to connect this back to the gold and what's happening to the gold. But I think this is a very important story because you're not able to uh, gin up a revolution in a country that is very, very wealthy because the vast majority of people who work hard are just interested in taking care of their families and uh, most of the democracies most people know are frauds anyway. So that's just not something that appeals to people who are trying to better themselves. I'm not saying that I support the Chinese government or the Hong Kong government. I don't support any of these governments. But the reality is, is that you're not going to be able to foment any type of color revolution in a prosperous country, at least not in my mind. So that is going to be a colossal failure on the part of the U.S. agencies, whoever they are. Now let's look at some of the numbers. This is not Hong Kong numbers, but these are Chinese numbers. And uh, the link came from a comment that I made on a Zero Hedger article about Chinese, the rich Chinese students in California driving around their Maseratis and their very expensive cars. Of course, the Chinese are rich and no one wants to admit it. And uh, the explanation there is they're rich because of corruption. Well, nobody gets rich because of corruption. The Zimbabweans aren't rich because they're corrupt. The Venezuelans aren't wealthy. They're corrupted. So there's no connection. In fact, there's a negative correlation between corruption and wealth. The reason why the Chinese are wealthy is because of how hard they work, how much they educate their children, and how little government dependence they have. They have virtually no welfare and very low unemployment. So let's look over at some of these Chinese numbers because they're absolutely shocking. We'll start off with GDP. Now, a lot of people are going to say, well, these numbers are cooked. Well, I don't think they are. I think they may be a little bit fudged, but if you look, I've done other videos about the trains in China, the wealth in China, the building boom in China, now we're seeing the gold accumulation in China. So this, let's look at some of these statistics because they really are shocking. You can see this is GDP. 2008 is when the financial crisis began. 34, 90, 92, almost a tripling of GDP since the beginning of the financial crisis. GDP per capita is not as dramatic, but you can see this is each person's share in the GDP. You're not seeing anything like this in the U.S. or the EU or Japan or Great Britain. Now, let's look at some labor statistics here. Let's look at the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate is just sitting there at 4%. They don't have unemployment in China or much of the rest of Asia. Why is that? Well, because they've had their test of centralized planned welfare state economies and they just have rejected them. Let's look at wages. Wages in China are shocking. Now they're not on par with what we have in the West. Of course, we're going down, they're going up. But just look at the movement in wages. You have more than a doubling of wages since the beginning of our financial crisis. Does it look to you from these numbers that China's in a financial crisis? I don't see any kind of financial crisis going on in China. So China is sucking up all the gold. They are getting wealthier and wealthier. And I want to show you that this gold repatriation is basically, in my opinion, a reaction to what China is already doing. And some of these countries panicking and realizing that they're going to be completely left out when the new system comes about, whatever system that is. So I wanted to take you to an old interview, and this is a member update because it's, I'm not sure what the status is of this PDF, but it's, uh, this is the Market Wizards. This is a classic. In, in my mind, this book is second only to Jesse Livermore's uh, reminiscences of a stock operator as far as the importance of this book. And about half of the people here actually cite Livermore's book as their most important influence. You can see Michael Marcus, Bruce, 
Bruce Kovner, uh, Richard Dennis, Paul Duder, Tudor Jones, Gary Byfelt, Ed Sakota, Larry Height, Michael Steinhardt, William O'Neill, David Ryan, Marty Schwartz, Jimmy Rogers, Mark Weinstein, Brian Gelbert, Tom Baldwin, Tony Saliba. So these are the traders, and they, let me show you. Um, we're going to look at Ed Sakota because I think what Ed said back then is very important and also very, very profound. In fact, just about everything that Ed Sakota says is very profound. Now, I don't agree with him about everything. I certainly don't agree with him about technicals and fundamentals because he doesn't believe in fundamentals at all. Uh, he was strictly a technical trader. Is one of the first to develop a computer trend following system. Obviously, you're going to have a tremendous amount of success if you're one of the first ones to develop the system. But let me show you how amazing the performance is that uh, Sakota did um, in his trading. So this is this is the performance track record that Jack Schwager asked him. What is the performance track record? And that's a, the fund that Sakota created. He says, I do not publicize my track record other than my model account, which is an actual customer account that started with $5,000 in 1972 and has made over $15 million. Theoretically, the total return would have been many multiples larger had there been no withdrawals. So you can see right here this performance here tells you that the efficient market hypothesis is nonsense that there are people who can consistently beat the market over and over and over again the mathematical odds of this occurring and by the way occurring with the 20 traders that are interviewed in this book uh, there is no possibility according to probability statistics that this could occur unless if, if it were random if it were a random walk uh, it's not random it's uh, intelligence so ask him here um, how many of those counts are still with you of those original half a dozen for one client made 15 million dollars decided to withdraw his money and manage it himself another made over 10 million dollars and decided to buy a house on the beach and retire what source did you learn from before designing your first system? I was inspired and influenced by the book Reminiscences of a Stock Operator. There you go. So now let's look at what we want to talk about here with this comment from Ed Sakota because uh, even though he's not a uh, person who believes in fundamentals, he actually has some very, very interesting things to say about the fundamentals. And I wanted to talk about his comment here specifically about gold and he makes a very interesting comment about gold and we're going to apply that to what we're seeing going on which I believe is short squeeze starting and then ultimately perhaps what at Sakota argues that we're looking at some type of centralization after the decentralization. So this is the question that Jack Schwager asked him, what is your long-term outlook for inflation, the dollar, and gold? Inflation is part of the way societies sweep away the old order. All currencies eventually get debased, like it or not. Compute one penny invested at the time of Christ, compounded at 3% per year. Then consider why nobody has anywhere near that amount of money these days. Okay, so let's, let's examine this. This is a very profound statement here. And I don't think a lot of people realize how profound this statement is. So let's take a look at it here and see how profound this statement is. Let's just go over here and use a compounding interest calculator. This is a calculator on investor.gov. So you can see it's real simple here. We're going to put in our current principal. It's a penny. And there, we're going to put in zero monthly additions. The years to grow, we're going to give it 2,000 years. And the interest rate is going to be 3%. And the answer is when we calculate this looks like we have a slow internet connection here
And the answer is, we're going to have to read it backwards. There's millions, there's billions, there's trillions, there's quadrillions, there's quintillions, there's sextillions. So the answer is that a penny invested at 3% interest per year at the time of Christ comes to 472 sextillion dollars. So there is proof to you that it is impossible for currencies to maintain their value with interest rates continuing. That is proof that the old order has to be swept away. There's no way around it. Now, let's look at the next statement. Gold tends to be dug up, refined, and then buried again. The geographical entropy of all gold on the planet seems to decrease over time. A lot has been collected in vaults. I project the trend as one toward a central world gold stash. Now that's very interesting. Most people would take that to mean that we are heading towards some type of one world government, SDR, or somebody like that having all the gold. I actually think that it may be China that ends up with the central world gold stash. That seems to be where we're going. And if we look at what's starting to happen now, he says that gold tends to be dug up. Now, gold is dug up and refined and then buried again. And that's a process we've already gone through. But what's happening now is that the gold that's being dug up and the gold that has already been buried is now being dug up again and being refined again, specifically in kilo bars, which is the denomination that the Chinese want. And there's two benefits to that. One is that's a, a weight that they use and they can denominate in that and indicate how much gold they control as the 400 ounce bars above ground become less and less and less. The kilo bars become more and more and more. And the second benefit, of course, is that by refining the bars that they get, they can avoid any type of tungsten bars or counterfeits. So we're at that process now where gold has actually been being dug up and being refined. And it's being dug up and sent to China and refined, and then I can guarantee you it's being buried again. So that's what we're looking at. I think we are looking at the beginning of a breakdown of this central holding of gold, and that is the U.S. and Britain. These empires are collapsing, or, or this empire is collapsing, and another one is rising in the east. It's a, a long process, but it's also... In my opinion, for reasons of Bible prophecy and Daniel 7 and China being the leopard, it's also going to be the fastest rise of any empire. So we can see here in silver, we have this key reversal above that downtrend line. Very, very importantly, we're also seeing the same sort of thing in gold. If we go out, we haven't yet broken through that downtrend line. Now that's important because silver seems to be leading not on a percentage basis, but on that trend basis. Gold as well does not have the same sort of volume, although it does seem to have a very large volume spike. So if this is the case, if I'm correct, and that this is the Ed Sakota predicted moment where gold is to be dug up and refined, then Ultimately, we're going to be looking at a short squeeze, in my opinion, especially if even a decent amount of number of these stand for delivery. And just like I said in my video bid only, I think that if this happens and we break out and start moving up, then the movement up could be so rapid that uh, we, we can't even guess how fast it's going to move. And we'll talk to you next time.